struggles. Ha. Huh. And one of Billy Graham's daughters had been through a number of unsavory relationships. And Billy and um, his wife Ruth advised one of his daughters not to marry a certain individual. And she chose to marry him. And as a result of that, what happened was within a few short months, they, he left. And here the daughter is sharing at her dad's funeral. And she said, you don't want to disappoint your dad, especially if your dad's Billy Graham. And she shares this story that now she's divorced and she's failed by the culture standards. And there's people quick to point out our failures, isn't there? And all of us have failed in some category. And now she doesn't have a place to go, and so she's got to go home to get her life back together. She doesn't have two nickels to rub together. And so she tells about driving this windy road in Asheville, North Carolina, up to her dad's place, not knowing how's dad going to respond. I know I've shamed the name of Billy Graham. How do you live up to that? And she drives into the driveway, and there's her dad, who rushes towards her. She gets out of the car. He envelops her, and he says, welcome home. Welcome home. This little 20-year-old girl that took her life, beautiful, gifted, placed her trust in Jesus Christ when she was growing up. And when she crossed over that precipice of her temporality into eternity, Jesus was there to embrace her and to say, welcome home. I don't know if you're new to our church I don't know if you've been around for a while, um, but you need to know we are all, including me, most of all, we're all broken people. And it's not thinking less of our sin, but it's thinking more of what our Savior did on the cross, is that he overcame sin and death to make all things new. And so you need to know you're coming into a dysfunctional group of folks that we got our warts and we got our failures by the world's standards, but we worship a Redeemer who makes sense out of the senseless and gives us hope. I, um, this past week, really about two weeks ago, I started this journey on the study that we're getting ready to start. And um, I just started looking up, just started Googling all the problems in the world. And you can, you can, there's so many lists out there. Everybody based upon their particular worldview has a list of what's wrong with the world. And, um, you know, there's lists of 10, 8, 5, 6, 4, whatever. And if you developed your list, you could develop a list and probably your list wouldn't match my list. And after reading all these different lists, I thought I would came up with my own. The, and I came up with the number eight. You could come up with more, you could come up with less. But these are Dan's eight problems with the world today. And it's fine if you disagree with my list. Make your own list. Number eight, war and terrorism. It's estimated the next generation might, quas- might quite possibly never know what peace looks like. Seven, um, under the category of nutrition, anything that goes in your body, uh, uh, poor diets, what comes into our body. And this may seem like kind of, what, you're talking about this? Well, your nutrition, part of nutrition is drinking water. And, and you think about what goes in your body can cause high blood pressure, low self-esteem, frustration, depression. When you consider drinking water alone, 1.4 million kids die each year to do quality of drinking water. 1.4 million kids because water's bad. In fact, it's estimated that more people drink bad water than good water. Six, uh, under the problem of refugees. 20 million people are what we call asylum seekers due to war and famine. You know, last week you were probably hustling and bustling until you get your Christmas decorations down and man, that tree's shedding on our carpet and 
and you've got a carpet where you've got a tree that's shedding. Can you imagine you've got your belongings in a bag and you're trying to get across some border because your home's gone, there's no freedom for you, and you're just trying to get from one place to the next before you run out of air. 20 million people. Under five, I put the whole topic of work, not having it, and on the other hand, not willing to do it. There's a welfare mentality that's created an entitlement. But then also under the category of work, there's the whole idea of slave labor taking advantage of workers that, you know, there's more people that's estimated in slavery today than was during the Civil War. Number four, poverty. Uh, it's estimated that th the food that we throw away in the United States could feed most of the starving third world nations. And it's not about overpopulation, even though there's 7 billion people in the world today. It's the distribution of what needs to go where. And I don't need to inform you, governments restrict flow in and out, and sometimes what's intended to go to certain locations is redirected to other locations just because somebody's got control of the push button. And then number three, the obvious drug abuse. There's always an individual who's driven to make money at someone else's expense and to take advantage of someone's addictive tendency. It's horrible. It's not only bad, it's just a miserable experience, not only for the person who is addicted, but for the family members around who are trying to maneuver and push the buttons in the right sequence to make life work. And then number two, it's the breakdown of the family, where the biblical model of one man and one woman for life is torn apart and a, a man is an image bearer of God and a woman is an image bearer of God. When you take God out of the equation and the breakdown of the family, the spinoff of the abnormalities just spins out out of control. A fellow by the name of Carl Zimmerman in 1947 wrote a book about the demise of cultures, every major culture in history. You go back and it's the breakdown of the family the nation soon ceases to exist. And then, of course, number one, the destruction of the image of God. The perfect, absolute creator, which all of life flows. God, the absolute origination of truth and acceptable behavior. When that is compromised, Romans assures us that we can be inventors of evil. Wow, that's good news, Dan. Thanks for coming. Wow, happy new year. And this is where we find ourselves. But here's the good news, that there are remnants remaining intact. And God is at work in the world through local bodies of believers. And he is ever present to redeem the world from sin and despair. Denise D'Souza writes about what's right with the church, what's right with the world, in which... Sure, the church and all its abnormalities and all its flaws, the local church helps keep sin at bay and promotes good in the world. You take the church out of the culture and yeah, you can criticize it and go, you guys are a bunch of hypocrites. No argument. We all are. We're all flawed. We're all broken. We need a savior. We don't have it together. The church isn't an organization that's got it together. The church is a bunch of beggars, but we know who to beg from. And so you take the church out of the culture and there's nothing to hold sin at bay. But the challenge for us in this little pocket of believers called GI free, how shall we then live? And the demand today is now more than ever, we got to know the word and understand our world to know now more than ever what to do with the word. And that's why I believe we need a book from God to speak into our situation. You don't need... Dan's opinions, you don't need man's opinions, we don't need committees to sit around and go, what should we do? We need the word of God. So why not go back 3,500 years to an Old Testament book? It's called the book of Judges. Huh? 3,500 years? Dan, do you think that's, that's what we need? I think there's some tendencies that have been constant for the past 3,500 years. I'm going to go back and I'm going to study the book of Judges. And let me give a disclaimer about the book of Judges. 
It's an Old Testament book that is incredibly complicated. It's full of unrecognizable names. It's written about places that no longer carry the same name. And so how do you study a book when we can't even keep the name straight and we can't understand where the action is taking place? And on top of that, it's very difficult to understand the culture and what was going on in the time period 3,500 years ago. Let me give you an example. In chapter 1 of the book of Judges, it talks about the descendants of Simeon and the descendants of Judah. They invade a certain pocket. They conquer a king. And when conquering the king, what they do is they take him captive and they cut off his thumbs and cut off his big toes. What? You're going, how do we make sense of that in 21st century America? Well, there's no way to make sense of that. We've got to be guided by biblical principles. But that was a common practice back then. You would conquer a people group, and what you would do is their main leaders, you'd hack off their thumbs and their toes because they couldn't hold a sword very good and they couldn't run very fast. And so that limited them militarily. And that's like, ooh, that sounds horrible. Thank you. <laughs> and we've got horrible things that we do too that are unthinkable by somebody else's generation. And, and yet, this was a raw, ugly world. Unfortunately, even though the Bible is historically accurate in all its accounts, it's not intended to be a history book. The Bible is a book written to change our heart, and as a result, our behavior will change. And the key for us as we observe an Old Testament book is to learn the principles that God wants us to transfer from the book to our lives. So let's go back. Let's go back 3,500 years. Uh, allow me to teach you some background um, so that we can understand the context and to understand some principles to know where and when this book of Judges took place. You ready? You remember Moses? Moses led the nation out of Israel, out of captivity, led the nation of Israel out of captivity in Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. For 400 years, Moses, under God's direction, towards the end of that 400-year period of time, under God's direction, Moses led the people out of slavery. He leads them, about a million and a half people, he leads them to Mount Sinai. There, the nation receives the Ten Commandments, the behavioral laws to say, this is what I demand of you. All to show us that we can't get to God on our own, that we need someone who will redeem us. But he gives them the Ten Commandments. Moses leads the nation of Israel, a million and a half people, back to Egypt to the Promised Land. The land now that we know as modern-day Israel. Other names for it would be the land mass itself, Canaan. Another name for it would be Palestine. Now, while the nation of Israel was in captivity in the nation of Egypt... Over those 400 years in captivity, foreign people groups had moved in and occupied the land once occupied by Israel. And so Moses stops the nation of a, hundred, of a million and a half people at this area called Kadesh Barnea. It's this oasis in the middle of the desert. And he sends 12 spies into Israel to see what are we up against? Who has settled in this land over the past 400 years that we're going to have to usurp and get out? 12 spies, a spy for each tribe of Israel. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, then 10 others. 10 spies come back and go, oh man. We were like, these people were like giants, and we were like grasshoppers in their sight. We can't take this land. But Joshua and Caleb were like, man, what are you talking about? The land's ripe for the taking. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. God's put it on a tee. Let's go. But the nation follows the ten rather than the two, and God grows tiresome of the nation's disobedience. And so he sentenced the nation to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. The reason? God has to drum Egypt out of their system. The magnitude of the miracle is unparalleled where the nation, a million and a half people, their shoes don't wear out and every day God drops 200 railroad cars full of food from heaven to feed them. The magnitude of the miracle is 
unparalleled in volume as well as time for 40 years, 38 to be exact. The discipline that the nation receives, every person that started the journey 20 years and older would die over the course of the 40-year excursion. Then finally, this nation now intact, wandering in the wilderness, comes to the promised land. Now, the torch has been passed to the next leader. His name is Joshua. He takes on the role of leader. He leads the nation of Israel into the promised land. He's got to eliminate these people groups, and so he conquers them first on the south, then on the north, and then he divides this piece of land up into 12 sections, 12 sections that will house each one of the 12 tribes of Israel. God had spent the last 40 years unifying the nation. They'd received the Ten Commandments. They were to remain pure as a nation. They were to put no other gods in front of them. They were not to compromise. They were to be totally committed. That meant they needed to drive the people that had previously inhabited the land out. Number one reason, so they would not intermarry. Well, that seems so cold and calculated. Well, you see, if they would have intermarried with those people, they would have inherited all the pagan gods that they worshipped. And job one, for the nation of Israel, their future depended on them obeying God. Big picture? They had one nation, Israel, a million and a half people, divided into 12 sections, each section housing one of the 12 tribes. The year was 1400 B.C. And Joshua, God's absolute appointed leader, is getting older. He will need to have someone else govern the nation. So God initiates the office of judge. One wise, godly judge will exercise all the powers we associate with the three branches of our government, legislative, administrative, and judicial. The bulk of the book of Judges tracks seven pattern cycles over 400 years. If you were to open your Bible and you were read book of Judges, it takes 400 years. But those 400 years are highlighted by the same cycle that happens seven times over the course of those 400 years. The cycles involve sin. As the Israelite nation would turn to idols and abandon God and the Ten Commandments, the nation would fall into sin. And then what happens on the heels of sin is you end up serving that which you were enslaved to. The next phase is servitude. As people are given over to their sin, God allows enemies to oppress his people. And then like clockwork, once we are serving the sin that we have chosen, then we cry for help. Supplication. As oppressed people return to their senses, they cry out to God for help, confessing their sins and repenting. And then God, he saves his people. Salvation happens. A judge leads the people back to God and defeats the oppressors. And then there's generally a period of silence or rest during which the judge appeals to the nation to remain faithful to the Lord. That cycle happens about 50 years happens about seven times through the course of Judges. The book of Judges takes about 400 years. That cycle happens seven times. You know, when you look at that cycle, sin, servitude, supplication, salvation, silence, yes, it's true about the nation of Israel that went through it seven times, but you know what? You and I go through it almost on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, maybe on a monthly basis. There's something that draws us, that woos us in, and we choose that forbidden fruit, whatever it is, and we choose to sin. And then if we let it long enough, we will end up serving the sin that we choose. We will come, become enslaved to it. And then what we do, once we realize, oh my gosh, what have I done? We cry for help. God, help me. We pray, help me, God, get out of this. I can't get out of it on my own. And that's a good place to be because we realize that he can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And then he is faithful and just to move into our lives, to forgive, to rebuild, to reconstruct, to redeem. You go, you haven't seen my life. No, God can't overcome this. If Jesus Christ can conquer death, which he did, then you know what? He can redeem your corrupt situation. Death, the greatest thing that we are all fearful of. Oh, my gosh. 
Mankind, how do, you, how do you conquer death and provide a way for others to do the same? It's the most feared, dreaded thing ever. When you come to the grave, you're like, oh, gosh, how, how do you answer that? Jesus does. And if Jesus can conquer death, then you know what? He can redeem our situation. Not that it's not consequence-free. There's consequences to our choices. But the ultimate consequence he can overcome because he can make all things new. No one can do that. Only our God can do that. And the tragedy is that this cycle is repeated over and over and over again. And despite repeated failures, God in his graciousness remains willing to redeem his straying people over and over and over the period of judges lasts close to 400 years. During that time, God uses a judge about every 50 years to deliver the nation from sin. My objective over the time together is to examine each of those seven cycles over the next seven weeks starting today. Exposing the oppressor, highlighting the seven main judges that God uses. So let's get started. If you were to look in chapter 1 and 2 of the book of Judges, um, it helps us get into the first cycle. Chapters 1 and 2 is immensely complicated, painstakingly detailed. To, so to assist us, for the sake of what I want to accomplish, I want to give you a helpful overview of chapter 1 and 2. We're not going to get into all the details and the um, inertia of it all. We're going we're to look at an overview. So... We find ourselves in chapter 1, the context is the nation of Israel under the leadership of Joshua has conquered the area of Canaan, modern day Israel, so that all the people of the 12 tribes will have a home to call their own. If you were to read chapter 1, you would say, there's a big idea here. The theme of chapter 1 of the book of Judges is incomplete obedience. And what you'd see is the nation of Israel are obeying God just enough to get by. An example of that is one of the tribes of Israel when Joshua was dividing up this landmass into 12 sections and the tribe of Dan, he gives a little landmass right in the center of the nation of Israel. In the following weeks, I'll give you a map and uh, that'll be a real attention getter. About 5% of you go, oh, awesome, a map. Others of you go, what's that? I got a GPS. GPSs have ruined our geography grasp, right? We don't know north, south, east, or west. We just know I'm supposed to take a left. We're horribly, that, that's a rabbit trail, sorry. So, where am I? Incomplete obedience. The nation had been divided up into 12 sections. The tribe of Dan's given a central section. The tribe of Dan takes it upon themselves. You know what? We don't really like that piece of land. Thanks, Joshua. What we'd like to do is we'd like to take a little piece of land up north. There's some waterfalls up there, real fertile land, snow-capped mountains. The water comes down, really fertile property. We're going to take that land. We, you're going to disobey what God has for you and take it upon yourself. Yeah, I don't think God really understands our situation here. Long story short, the tribe of Dan, no more. Done, gone, baked, destroyed, wiped off the planet. In fact, if you go to Revelation chapter 9 where it talks about the descent of the 12 tribes of Israel and it lists the 12 tribes of Israel and their position in heaven... Dan isn't even listed. Julie used to say to the kids when they were growing up, as slow obedience is no obedience. Parents, write that one down. Slow obedience is no obedience, or partial obedience is partial disobedience. There's a clause in verse 21 that sums up the attitude and behavior of the nation in chapter 1. It says, they did not did not drive out the people group who dwelt in Jerusalem. It's repeated again in verse 27, repeated again in verse 31. 
See, there are consequences beyond our perspective of the commands that our authority gives us. God, our ultimate authority, gives us commands, and we think in our temporality, we don't see his overarching picture. And so what we do is we take it upon ourselves to go, let me help you out, and I'm going to kind of distinguish what I think is appropriate. It's the, I didn't think it was any big deal. Now, the whole idea, remember, if you intermarry with people that don't hold your conviction, what will happen is they will pull your conviction down. And before you know it, your children and your children's children won't even know who the Lord is. We do it all the time in our culture in the name of, I didn't think it was any big deal. I didn't think it was any big deal for me to give to God. I didn't think it was any big deal for premarital sex. I didn't think it was any big deal that all religions, all religions are basically the same, aren't they? I didn't think it was any big deal to accept someone else's view as equally valid as my own, which by the way is pluralism and tolerance, the plague of our thinking culture. And it goes all the way back to the creation where you remember, it's like, well, I, I thought that fruit, that tree was good for food. I didn't think it was any big deal to participate in that forbidden fruit. Very quickly in the name of, I didn't think that sin was a big deal. We become too accepting of sin as a behavior that's just not that bad. And so if chapter one warns us about incomplete obedience, chapter two teaches once you embrace incomplete obedience, the next step is active disobedience. Always on the heels of partial obedience is total disobedience. And lest you wonder what God thinks when we know the right thing to do and we choose not to do it, we choose to do the exact opposite. In chapter 2, over and over and over again, gives us statements that reveal God's attitude about sin. You know what God thinks about sin? It says it provokes God to anger. You know what God thinks about sin? The anger of the Lord burns. He says in another statement, he gave them into the hands of their plunderers because of their sin. Because of their sin, he sold them into the hands of their enemies. Because of their sin, the hand of the Lord was against them for doing evil. The hand of the Lord caused the anger of the Lord to burn It says because of their sin, God allowed evil nations to remain. Now, why would we think that God is okay with sin today? We've got this picture that, oh, God's like, oh, boys will be boys, and he just turns a blind eye to it and says, oh, I I just don't want to know. Throughout the scriptures, we're so weak on this. Throughout the scriptures, there is always a penalty that must be paid for sin. The good news is that Jesus did it for us. Jesus died on the, that's why he went to the cross, to pay the penalty for our sin. There's always a penalty for our sin. You know, all those people that hurt you and, oh, I want God to get them. You know what? The penalty's already been paid. Jesus did it on the cross. We think there's this thing that uh, in our faulty thinking, it's called licentiousness. It's taking sin lightly is not that big of a deal. Today we package and sell it in the form of everybody's doing it. It's 2020. Sin's not that big of a deal. An example of that is today human sexuality is scarred beyond recognition. Because when God is taken out of the equation, there's no image that's a requirement to show off. What do I mean by that? Well, a man is an image bearer of God, a woman is an image bearer of God. And if a man is an image bearer of God and a woman is an image bearer of God and you take God out of the equation, there's no image to show off. There's no moral compass. And as a result, Romans would tell us we can become inventors of evil when there's no moral compass. So let's look at the first cycle. We're ready? We're going to look at chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. In chapter 3, starting in verses 1 and 2, it says this. Now these are the nations which the Lord left to test Israel by them, that is, all who had not experienced any of the wars of Canaan. 
only in order that the generations of the sons of Israel might be taught war, those who had not experienced it formerly. Basically, in verses 1 and 2, it's getting into the sin of the nation because the Israelite people have been disobedient. Verses 1 and 2 is basically pointing out that God still has the nation's greater good in mind. God knows that once the nation repents, they're going to have to have some skill in war to protect themselves. So God, in his sovereignty, even in his graciousness, will use non-believing empires to rule over them, but at the same time teach them lessons of warfare that will benefit them down the road. So God is still thinking about their long-term greater good, even in the midst of their sin. By the way, just a caveat, During this time, because there was no loyalty to God, none of those 12 tribes had any loyalty to each other. Again, when you look at Old Testament books, you need to think in terms of principles. Each one of these 12 tribes, when they took their eyes off of God, just became self-focused. And once you take your eyes off God, unity among one another is impossible. It flies out the window. The only way a body of this size can be unified is as we die to ourselves and look to God. As we look to him, then unity is possible. We take our eyes off God and there's no unity. And that's what happened. The 12 tribes, they just looked after their own interests. And once you look after your own interests, then unity is impossible. Then look at verse 3. It says, these nations are five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites and who lived in Mount Lebanon from uh, Mount Belharmon and all the way as far as Lebo Hamath. It's basically saying the nation was ruled by other leaders as far as it was from north to south to east and west. God's just mentioning these nations that are going to be over Israel to subject them to their laws and their jurisdiction because of their sin. Now look at verse 4. They were for testing Israel to find out if they would obey the commandments of the Lord which he had commanded their fathers through Moses. Verse 4 basically points out that there's something about consequences at the hands of an evil influence that will make you long for the good old days. There's always a reoccurring theme throughout the scriptures of the prodigal son story where people go, oh man, I've got myself in a fix. I wish I had what it used to be like at dad's. And then look at verse 5 and 6. He says, the sons of Israel lived among the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and the Mosquito Bites. That is an old joke. I apologize. And they took their daughters for themselves as wives and gave their own daughters to their sons and they served their gods. And basically, verses 5 and 6, the full force of the consequence of their disobedience is being experienced because the Israelites intermarried with those foreign people groups that, they, that were ruling them. And see, there's something that we under, need to understand. In our culture, it's, we, we experience in our culture the diversity of marriage. We, in this room, probably, that you've married somebody from a different city. You married somebody, there's people married each other from a different state. Some of you married each a different country. Some of you married somebody from a different planet, right? But yet, in that, that's okay. That's good in the, in the diversity of your ethnicity coming together. There's nothing wrong with that. But the problem is, is when you compromise, we need to draw the line when it comes to the biblical mandate not to marry someone you're unequally yoked with, an unbeliever. Because God wants us to maintain a spiritual purity. Because what happens is, it's like when you as a believer marry somebody that's an unbeliever, the unbeliever can pull the believer down and compromise your convictions. And that's why God didn't want them intermarrying with foreign people groups because he knew that your children are going to forget God and your children's children won't even know who Jesus is. And then in verse 7, The sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God. In about 30 short years, the nation of Israel had forgot God and served then Baals and Asheroth. Verse 7 highlights the nation of Israel was evil in the sight of God because they were worshiping Baal, which is the male fertility god. Asherah was the female counterpart. They went together, and the worship of these Asherah and Baal 
included sex with someone you were not married to, which disintegrates a family. So chapter 3, 1 through 7, the nation sinned. (laughs) <laughs> They'd been led through the wilderness for 40 years. God had fed them 200 railroad cars full of food. They, they, they had spared them from the Egyptians. They, miracle after miracle, their, their shoes didn't wear out for, for 40 years. And now, in a few short years, they forget God and start worshiping these idols who are really just make-believe. They're not even real. They succumb to sin. Now look at verse 8. As a result of that sin, then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of Cushon Rishathim, king of Mesopotamia. The sons of Israel served Cushon Rishathim eight years. What follows sin is servitude. Your sin of choice will entangle you and you will become enslaved to it. If what the nation was experiencing wasn't enough, God uses a powerful king from Mesopotamia. His name was Cushon Rishathim. Let me translate his last name. Rishathim means double wickedness. Can you imagine? This was not a kind king, and now he's ruling Israel because of their sin, their consequences of their sin. Cushon of double wickedness ruled over Israel for eight years. Let the principle teach you. A mentor of mine said it best. He said, you will never find in sin what you go into sin to find. You will never find in sin what you go into sin to find. You're tempted by something and you think, oh, this is going to deliver. This is going to feel good. This is going to solve all my problems. I'm going to be moving and shaking with this. You will never find in sin what you go into sin to find. Your sin of choice will enslave you. And so Kushan double wickedness enslaved them for eight years because of their sin. It was only their, it was their fault. And by the way, many times we need to grow up and go, you know what? The reason I'm in the situation I'm in is because of my sin. God didn't put you there. Um, somebody else didn't trick you. Uh, the devil didn't do it. You are responsible for your choices. And then in verse 9 and 10, what happens is we come to our senses in the midst of our sin. Verse 9, he says, when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the sons of Israel to deliver them. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. Verse 10, it says, and the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel. And when he went out to war, the Lord gave Cushon double wickedness, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand so that he prevailed over Cushon double wickedness. We sin, and what happens is we fall into this proverbial prison. We are entangled by it, and just like clockwork, what happens is we cry for help. Oh, God, help us. It's called supplication. God, help us get out of what we've gotten ourselves into. And God is incredibly gracious. You know, you you have been fed this wrong thinking that somehow the God of the Old Testament is this mean God, and the God of the New Testament is a God of graciousness. You're not reading the Bible I'm reading. Yes, God has, has shown us the cross in the New Testament, but God is just as gracious in the Old Testament as he is in the New. He is the same today, tomorrow, as he was yesterday. And God raises up a man by the name of Othniel. His father's name was Kenaz. Kenaz was the brother of the famous Caleb, the Caleb that you've heard about who goes in to take the promised land. He's one of the spies that goes, hey, the land's ripe for the taking. So Othniel comes from pretty good stock. So what do we know about this Othniel? Well, very little. But in chapter 1, verses 11 through 15, there's a brief story that gives us something to go on. Under Caleb's leadership, there was a city named Deber that had been promised to Caleb by Moses himself years earlier. And Caleb was really old at the time, and he wasn't really uh, strong enough to go out to battle. So he offered to the soldier that conquered the city of Deber his daughter's hand, Aksa, in marriage. That's a good name to, de- mar- to name your daughter, Aksa. And Othniel said, I'll do it. 
She must have been a catch for him to want to take on the challenge of taking on this fortified city and conquering this fortified city. And so Othniel captured the city of Debur, and I'm sure he captured Axel's heart as well. Now, what's important about that story? Well, it, it seems to me that during a time where it was common practice to partially obey or partially disobey, Othniel was a total obedience kind of a guy. Othniel was an all-in kind of a guy. And so the nation under Othniel experienced deliverance from old king double wicked. They experienced salvation. God's so gracious to get us out of the fix we're in, to redeem our story. You know, you can't get, it, can't get me out of my, well, yeah, he can. If he conquered death, then he can conquer, he can redeem your story. So then in verse 11, then the land had rest for 40 years and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. So the people experienced peace for 40 years. There's silence. When we look at that cycle, sin, servitude, supplication, salvation, silence, Yes, it's true that this nation experienced that as a nation seven times, but you know what? You and I experience this on a weekly, monthly, yearly basis where we fall into sin, where we never find in sin what we go into sin to find. And by the way, when you get up to the precipice of sin and you're going, should I or shouldn't I? By the time you get to that point with your sin choice, it's too late because it's too tantalizing to go ahead and should I? I'll go ahead and go for it. And we sin, and then we fall victim to it. We can entangled to that sin of our choice. There's an old parable about somebody who was sinning after food, and he was running through a market, and he saw a sausage, and he's thinking, I want that sausage, and he grabs the sausage. You remember how sausages used to be? The membrane was connected to another sausage, which was connected to another side. It kind of looked like a rope was tying all these sausages together. So he goes through the market, he grabs a sausage, and he starts running, unbeknownst to him that the sausage is connected to 44 other sausages. And then they fling around, and they wrap around him, and he gets caught and tangled and falls down. And isn't that what our sin does? Our sin entangles us and brings us down <laughs> We become enslaved to it. The very loot we steal traps us. And then like clockwork, what do we do? We cry for help. Oh, God, help us. And God is faithful and just to forgive us. He, he redeems us. He rescues us. So good. And then there's a period of silence where during that period of silence is the time where we're most vulnerable because we're, our mind is prone to wander. We think, man, I've got the tiger by the tail. Everything's going good. I'm not caught in any sin. There's no problems. Got everything in line. That's the most dangerous time for a believer. There's a fellow <clears throat> by the name of Joe Aldrich that says the enemy will wait sometimes 40 years if necessary to set a trap for you. That time where you think, well, I'm not like other people, man. I've got it all together. There was a fellow who wrote a book about how great generals succeed, and he writes this. He says, attacks are least successful from the front because your front is well fortified. But it's only then during periods of ease and comfort and routine we let our guard down. Then when we least expect it, temptation comes in through the door that has been lazily left open. And as those back doors in our life are lazily left open, we start hearing ourselves say, it's not that bad. It's 2020. Nobody will know. See, the most dangerous time is a time of silence. Here, here's, the, here's the question for you, and we're going to ask it over the course of the next seven weeks. Every single one of you are in one of those categories right now. Maybe you right now, you're enmeshed. You're tangled up with those sausages. You're tangled up with sin, whatever it is. Could be lust, finances, lying, cheating, stealing. What? I don't know. Maybe you're just wrapped up in sin. And then you're serving it. You're spending your whole life trying to make it work. Or maybe you're at the point, and it's a good point, where you're going, oh, God, help me. Get out of this. 
that's a good day. Or maybe you're right in the throes of God rescuing you and you are just basking in his goodness. Oh, God, thank you that you're rescuing me. And you just, it's one of those moments where you're just in love with Jesus. Or maybe like most believers, you're just kind of going, well, I'm glad I'm not like the Pharisees. Glad I don't have any problems. Glad everything's just copacetic for me. It's the most vulnerable time in the world. We're going to take communion here in a second. And communion is such a visual aid to bring us back to the cross because what it does is it reminds us of the sin and our intentionality to get out of sin. That the cross of Christ paid the penalty for our sins, and so therefore it's intentional to say, I want to get out of the sin I'm in. But also communion it helps us recognize and to go, I don't want to fall into sin. I want to be as intense today as I was yesterday. I don't want to let my guard down and let sin come in the back door. I don't want to be intense. I don't want to just, just take it for granted and just coast. At this time, what I'd like to do is ask the ushers, if you would pass out the elements. And can I ask you, as you get the elements, just to hold the cup and the bread in your hand, and what we'll do is I'll guide you through, we'll take them together. Um, but as you get your elements, just begin to ask yourself the question, you know, where am I in this? What sin do I need to repent from, or what, what sin do I not need to go, I don't want to get into that one. Just allow the Holy Spirit to massage your heart as Jeanette plays some background music.
there are three directions that the Lord calls us to look when we come to the Lord's table. He calls, us, he calls us to look back at what he did for us on the cross. That when he died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, he took all our sins, past, present, and future, and threw them as far as it is from east to west. But then also he calls us to look in, to make sure that we are taking the table without unconfessed sin in our life. And that's where we come to these phases and we go, Lord, I, Will you assist me to be intentional uh, to get out of any sin that I'm in and let the Holy Spirit massage your heart? If, there's a, uh, if you're hiding a sin, just confess it to the Lord. He already knows you're hiding it. Lift it to him. Allow him to forgive you and, and to renew you, to redeem your story, to give you a do-over and a hope of new beginning. But then he also calls us to look forward the fact that he's coming back again someday. And so it causes us to want to live with intentionality to know that um, our, our behavior has consequences in the future. In the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And that bread represented his body that would be broken. And he, when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Together, let's participate. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant. It's a new agreement in my blood. Up until that time, we would have had to take a lamb to the slaughter. Now, Jesus' blood covers our sins. He says, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord God, give us courage over the next several weeks to call sin what it is and to run from it and to run from you and to realize that you, no matter what mistakes we've made, you embrace us and say, welcome home. Lord God, I, I, I pray that we would take your timeless truth and we would have the courage to consist, consistently apply it in a timely way. We pray these things in Jesus' matchless holy name. All God's people said, amen. I want to make a, uh, are you aware of a couple of things?